Evening, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to see Pakanen. He's going to be talking to you guys about builds, dependencies, and deployment in the modern multi-platform world. Can everyone please give a warm welcome? Good afternoon. Uh, as mentioned, I am Yusuf uh, Pakanen. For my day job, I work as a consultant for this company who you can't pronounce unless you're Finnish, so that's not even try. Um, but they're, anyway, they're called Rakatetier. And the presentation that I'm going to have doesn't necessarily reflect their opinions, so what I'm about to say is only my personal opinion. So this was about deployment and dependencies and all the stuff. So let's start with the obvious, which is distro packages. And distro packages are awesome. And if there are people in the room or in the live stream at home, and if you're working with distro packaging, creating packages, or doing any of that good stuff, you are all awesome people. I love each and every one of you. However, here's a tweet from Matthew Garrett from a few months ago where he says, the thing where it's easier to download the Windows version of an app and run it under Wine than it is to deal with packaging. And Matthew Garrett is a guy who knows pretty much about Linux. And is he, if he's having problems, it's fairly certain that other people are having some as well. So let's look at this. So how much effort is it to provide a binary package for developers? Let's say you're developing a library and you want to provide it for people to use. Well, the first thing is, is you need to get it into Debian. And um, as a data void, I work on the mesh and build system. And getting it into the Debian took about a year. Uh, uh, it, so they were very responsive at all the sort of stuff. But eventually, there was no sponsors. Um, and then I had to pester one of my coworkers, who was a Debian developer. And then he agreed to put it, because he's an awesome guy, guy like that. And then when you get your stuff into Debian, you might be having this sort of discussion. So I went, OK. So when will it get to stable? And it's like, no, well, you just missed the release window, so maybe in about five years. And the usual reply to this is a, either a proverbial or an actual middle finger. So you have to be careful. But OK, so you get it into Debian, and everything is fine. Well, not really, because then there's Fedora. You need to get it into Fedora, and, you, and there's Arch, and there's Slackware, and there's FreeBSD, and OpenBSD, and NetBSD, and DragonflyBSD, and SpaceCupBSD, and all of this stuff. And they all have their own packaging systems. And if you are like a not an established project, then you have to do the work to get it into each and every one of those. You can't rely on other people doing them, because there's only a limited amount of people to do that. But OK, you work, do your thing. You got your stuff in there, and everything is fine. Well, not really, because then there's OS 10. So if you want to support OS 10 uh, natively, you need to provide what's called an OS 10 framework. And because OS 10 doesn't have a package manager, it has Vibe. Uh, there's Mac ports, Sphinx, Homebrew, and all stuff. And the same applies. You have to do the work to get it into each and every one of these, because you can't rely on them, because they're quite busy. But this should be OK. No, but then there's Windows. And in order to support Visual Studio, and I have to draw my breath for this one, you have to provide a shared and static threaded and non-threaded, debug and non-debug, and three different exception unwind versions for each compiler version that you want to support. So that's two times two times two times three times maybe four different packages. And that's just to support Visual Studio, because then you have to support MinGW. Um, sorry, that's wrong. You have to support multiple different versions of MinGW, which are all incompatible with each other. And then there's Sigwin, and there's NuGet, and there's a ton of these. And then. There are platforms which have no packaging systems whatsoever. So if you do bare metal development, uh, then you can't rely on a packaging system because the metadata for the packaging system might not fit inside the microcontroller that you're running. So you can't have that. iOS, no package management. Can't have that. You have to embed everything. Android, no package management. You just get the SDK. You do the rest. Um, and there's XDJ app, which is the future of applications on Linux. And one of the things which is not often mentioned is that XDJ apps are not allowed to touch any of the system packages. So you can't rely on system packages to provide your dependencies. You have to provide them yourself. And uh, finally, uh, Canonical would not be Canonical if they didn't have their own incompatible version of this as well. And that's what they have in there. So in the end, we find that the packaging work for a simple library can be an order of magnitude more than doing the actual coding. And now you don't have a single bug tracker. You have 20, because all of your stuff is spread out. And you might have bugs in Debian, might have bugs in Red Hat, 
and all this sort of stuff. And just keeping up with all of these things is a full-time job, almost. Okay, but now you have your package, you provide it to everyone, and things are fine. Well, not really, because then you get to do deployment. And deployment is even worse than that. Um, so as a refresher, what things that go wrong, which is the old-fashioned dependency hell, is that you have an application and you have a dependency on some sort of libfoo 1.2.8, which is fine. However, the distro provides only 1.1.0. So the normal answer to this is that you take the source code and you build a new package and you install it because it's binary compatible, you just drop it in and everything works. Except that there are bugs and you might get into a situation where the system things that are running depend on a version that's older than the one that you need to support. So you either have an operating system that doesn't boot or you have an application that doesn't launch. So what do you do? And if you answer Docker, then you fail at this particular thing because what if this is a bug in your Docker container? It can happen. So the core problem of, of all of these is the fact that the software stack is divided into two very different pieces. There's the platform, which is at the bottom, and then there are the applications that sit on top of that. And the requirements for a platform are very specific. You, you have update cycles of years, and stability is the most important thing that you can have. You have to keep it stable, don't change anything, because people rely on your stuff. And backwards compatibility is massively important. You don't break backwards compatibility ever. And then on top of that, you have the applications. And for an application, the most important thing in an application's lifecycle is that once the developer does a release, then it must be available to everyone who uses that application within a day. And that's just like, if you're doing web applications, you're doing phone applications, it doesn't matter. This is the one that actually matters. You have to get it out as soon as possible. And also there's no need to support any of the old releases, so if you have a user that says a bug report, I, okay, I have a bug, and then you say, well, well what version are you running? It's 1.2.3, and then you can say, okay, update to 1.2.4 because it might be fixed in that one. And for an application, this is something that's totally valid to do. It's totally fine, but this is the most wrong thing that you can do if you try to do this in the platform. You just don't do that. You, you take this off, you do distro patches and all that stuff just to keep the stability and everything. So the, the problem then becomes that the requirements for these two different kinds of things are so far apart and they're heading in the opposite directions so that if you try to put them in the same namespace, which is what distro packages does, is that it's doomed to fail. It just doesn't work. And it cannot be made to work because the requirements are just so massively different. So what are people using them? Because applications get deployed all the time. Well, there, there are a bunch of different ways that you can get around it. Uh, embedding dependencies as a source, which uh, the, the distro packages hate with a passion for, and for very good reasons. But it's very common, you start working on some project, you take some upstream source code, you put it inside the thing, fiddle with it so it builds, use it, and never update it ever again. Um, then you can have an internal package manager, and which is very common, it's like things like Python has one, Ruby has one, uh, Rust has one, Go has one, and even Emacs has an internal package manager. And that's just to solve the exact same problem that you need to ship stuff faster than what the distros can provide. And, and then there's Dockers and all the other stuff, containers which solve the problem of dependencies by saying, uh, well, if it works on my desktop machine, why don't we ship my desktop machine and use that one? Which is one way of doing it. Um, but, and then there's other various different ways. And this is gets, wheel gets reinvented all the time. And embedding dependencies is something that you really don't want to be doing. It's quite bad. But unfortunately, it's mandatory. So if you want to provide native applications for Windows, OS X, Android, iOS, XDDF, any of the others, you have to embed your dependencies. There simply isn't an option. This is the only way that you can get anything done. And this is what people are actually doing because it's the only thing that works. Notice XDJ app, so that's the future of the software in there. And if you do the math, this count for about 99% of all desktop application deployments and 99.9 .9 for mobile. And some people might say that there should be more nines at the end of these numbers. You make the call yourself. And 
this, this, these numbers raise interesting questions, like how do we get people to use free software more and participate in the open source movement? Well, one way is that we actually go where they are rather than expecting them to come to us. So if we have applications, free software applications that we can deploy on them, then people start using them and they learn this. And this is the way, for example, how Firefox got all of their, but that's why it's an influential thing in the world because they actually did a Windows version and people love it. And, and it's a great advertisement for free software in general. Um, but if you talk to these, the people with seasoned Unix experience, what they will tell you is that, but no, I'm a pure free software project. I would never embed my dependencies because that's just wrong. But the thing is that if you start to do, do some digging, look at projects, like what do they have in their source trees, you find interesting things. As an example, uh, package config, the tools used to, to, for dependencies, embeds a full copy of glib in its source tree. And this is just the way they have to do that, because if you want to support AIX and all those other things, they don't have glib, there's no package me mechanism to install it, so you have to embed it, because that's the only way you can actually make it work. But let's do more of an exception thing. If you look into glib, we find that they ship an entire copy of Perl compatible regular expressions. And for the exact same reasons. On Windows, they want to support stuff. There's no regular expression library there. They have to either re-implement it themselves or they use PCRE. And if you want to use PCRE, you have to ship it because that's the only way to actually make it work. So then we find is that uh, embedding dependencies is something that everybody actually does. And those who say that they aren't doing it are lying. So these are very, very opposing views, and it's, there's been lots of, lots of bad blood between the two camps who want to embed and those who want to do everything by distro packages. So the, the, the way to get forward is that, so is there a way that we can unite these two? They're very different views. So this is the project that we've been working on for the past few years, which is called the Mess and Build System, which has this uh, wrapped dependency system as well. The, the basic premise of it is that there's a build system which doesn't suck. And I'm not going to go much into detail about the build system itself, but if you're interested in that, uh, I encourage you to watch the presentation from last year's LCA, which is uh, entitled Making Build Systems Not Suck. So, and the main design thing about the mess and build system is that when you do a build definition, it should be composable. So you can, if you have any mess and project, you can take that and embed it inside your own project as a, and it runs it in a sandbox. And it looks as if it was a native part of your source tree, even though it really isn't. And it has uh, kind of like an internal package config, so the uh, libraries can say, okay, if you want to embed me and use me, this is how you would then get it done. And the design is that um, toggling between and system provided dependency and the one provided by this system is transparent. Your build definitions don't change. They're exactly the same. Uh, that's a bit abstract, so let's, let's look about like an example of this. So there's a project, it's called Fubar, written in C, and it has version 1.0. And we build a shared library in it. It's called Foo. And then we declare a dependency. And it has some include directories, where this is where the headers are. And then it says that you need to link with this library to get it to work. Very simple, right? And then when we want to use that, it's a completely different project, which is some application. Uh, and this is how it, how it goes. So we have a dependency call, and what this does is that it goes into the system and see, does the system provide this? Usually via package config, but there are some other tricks as well. The required false merely states that if it's not found, then that's not an error. You can just keep on going. So if the dependency is not found, then we run the sub-project, which is the, the project that we saw earlier. So it takes it, runs it, and then you get out this in opaque object which represents the project. And then we dive into that, and we take out the, the variable which we use to store the internal dependency, and we take it out from there, and we put it inside the foo dep uh, variable here in the outer project. And then that's it. And then we build an executable, 
with uh, some, some there. And then we use the dependency that we got from earlier. And there's, there you go. So the definition for the executable is exactly the same. There's only one ex definition, but depending on whether you got the dependency from the system or if you build it yourself, then it will use that and it will just work. Now this is a bit, bit of a, a long thing to write. So we had this sort of shorthand for that. So we have a dependency and just say the fallback is this internal project with this variable name. So this is the build definition in its entirety. So in three lines of code, one of which is just the project, we have now created a system where you can toggle between embedded dependencies, assisted dependencies transparently. So whatever your requirements are, you can always do the one thing that's required there. So if you want to do distro packaging, use that. If you don't, if you want to ship your own stuff, you can do that as well. And this is perhaps the most important slide of this presentation. Uh, so build definitions should be Legos. And the power of a Lego doesn't come from the fact that it's shaped like that. It's the fact that you can take any of these and put them together and you can build wonderful stuff. And composability is the key word here because you can just put things together and they work together seamlessly. Now, uh, there's a dip, uh, bit of a thing because this only works for projects which have a mess and build definition. And there's not, unfortunately, many of those around yet. So what we did is that there's a web service. Um, don't go to it now because the server has crashed. But, <laughs> but it's a repository where you can submit any, any project and write uh, a message definition, build definition for that, and then you can use it. So it's, it's kind of like the Debian experience. You have the upstream source tar file, and then you have the diff for that, which provides the build definition. And then if you want to use it in your own source tree, then you just use the wrap tool, which is included, and say wrap tool install lib PNG, and then it will go out and download all the stuff for you. And this has a nice side effect because then you can have native support for Windows OS 10 and all those stuff that you really care about because you can just download all of your dependencies and it's all fine. So uh, anything that the underlying build that rules support, you can use it on. So if, if you have a library that uses, that provides, works on Windows and OS 10 and Android, you can use it on any one of those. And as an example of what you can achieve, so here's a, a sample SDL2 application that I wrote. It's, it has these graphics and it's, it, they roll around on the screen and play some sound using SDL2. And there you can see it's, it's got, uh, there's Ubuntu, then there's OS 10, and then there's Windows XP. There's GCC, Clang, and Visual Studio. And uh, on all of these platforms, when you compile it, it downloads SDL source tree and it compiles it, links it, and then builds an application and embeds all of these graphics inside the binary and all that stuff. And this is all of, altogether 33 lines of build definitions of which the dependency part is about three. So it's, just, it's kind of nice, you can get, get to do all sorts of things. Uh, but th th there are side effects to this because this lowers the barrier of entry for people who are not running Linux because if you have like, Windows developers who want to participate, then you can say, okay, here's, a, here's my Git repo, do a checkout, start compiling, it will download all the dependencies that it needs, and you just wait until it finishes, and then you can do your own stuff. As opposed to, well, first you need to uninstall an entire Unix user land in your thing and use MinGW and all that stuff, and at which point people just stop caring and don't work anymore. But with this, you can just like, do the, do the, use the tools that you like, it's, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll just work with that. But then you get into the other interesting territory. So if you have this kind of system, does it allow you to do something that distro packages don't? Well, as an example, uh, all the dependencies from distros come in shared libraries. And shared libraries are built with fpick. And depending on the platform you're running on and all the other stuff, fpick has up to 10% performance penalty. So if you just take the dependencies, compile it as a static library, and link it in your own application, you might get a performance boost. No code changes at all. And uh, then there's uh, link time optimization, which is actually global. So usually you have code that looks like this. You have some sort of opaque pointer and, uh, from some shared library, and then you get bar get foo, and then you get back another pointer. And then you do foo get x, which 
on the thing, and you get some x value out of that one. So this is two calls, two function calls, which are non-inlineable, and into different parts of your application area. So it's, it's potentially two instruction cache misses right there. But if you do global LTO, it turns into this, because the linker can actually see the entire program. It, can, it knows what's happening. Then it can start inlining stuff across shared library boundaries, because they're no longer shared libraries. And it's, all, it's all type safe and everything. No, nothing about that is lost but you get the extra performance of that. But it requires that you build your stuff yourself, because if you get it from a shared library, then this is an optimization that you cannot do. Um, and there's more stuff, so there's uh, profile guided optimization. The, the basic way it works is that you compile your application, and then you run it on some sort of representative sample of your data, and then it instruments it and do, does all sorts of magic stuff, and then you compile it again, and then it will optimize it based on the patterns that your data has. And you get a performance boost from that. And again, if you do the global PGO, it will do the same thing for your entire dependency stack. So you can have a dependency stack that is it's totally optimized for the, uh, your application and the data that your application is dealing with, which might be nice in, in some instances. Um, so if you look at what this actually means, this is very similar to what the JIT compilers do for JavaScript. Uh, it's not an actual JIT compiler because it's, it's done all ahead of time, but the, the, all the tricks and tools that they're using are pretty much the same, and, and you can get all sorts of wonderful performance boosts in there. But it's, it's not only related to performance, so there are these uh, instrumentation tools, uh, memory sanitizer, thread sanitizer, the de uh, debug mode for STL, uh, which um, require, some of them require that you build your entire application with the same flags because they change the ABI of the system. Uh, so if you have parts which are compiled with different flags, they won't work together. So, it, but if you can do this and you can build all of your dependencies yourself in a single step, then you can just put all the flags you want and then you can get all sorts of wonderful instrumentation and you can use this to get rid of bugs and all that sort of stuff. Going further, then you can also do things like uh, do a statically linked binary or embed the shared libraries within your own package. You can curate binaries that work on all distros, even the ones that don't provide any sort of uh, platform support. Um, and this is a bit tall order, so let's test this. Uh, so I downloaded the source, uh, the Red Hat Linux 6.2, which was the oldest Linux version I could find where there was an ISO available and then source code for GIMP 1.0.4, and they're both from the year 2000. And using this Red Hat installation, I compiled the source code and created it into a bundle using only the tools that were available at the time, and then this is what it looks like. So there you have on the left uh, GIMP uh, 2.8.14 from the Ubuntu package repositories, and running on the same machine, and it's not X trickery, it's actually running on the machine, is GIMP 1.0.4 from the year 2000. Um, there's been a, quite a lot of change in the, the GIMP. You can see that the basics are still the same. It's pretty cool. So what does this mean? So in the year 2000, you could create applications, right, that were fully self-contained, required no installation, required no compilation. You just download and run without any root privileges or any of that required. And more importantly, that would run unchanged 16 years later on a different CPU architecture on distro that didn't exist when the application was written. Um, Linux gets a bad rap about ABI compatibility, but if you do it right, you can actually get massively huge uh, things about it. And this comes, then it's an inconvenient truth, and I suspect that this is gonna get on the internet, um, but the biggest cause of Linux binary incompatibility is the concept of distro packages. Because if you tried to get the distro packages from the year 2000 to run a modern machine, it just wouldn't work. Um, but if you do it yourself, then you can make it work. And there. But uh, all of this still doesn't change the main problem. And if you talk to people about this, this is the actual real problem that all of these, if you do embed your dependencies, this is the problem. So you do your thing, and then you ship out, and then your user, but you get a bucket of bits. And it's like, 
well, what's in it? You can't possibly tell. It's like, does it have security vulnerabilities or whatever? And you can't tell. It might have OpenSSL 098, and then you try to do something, and then, then people from Russia have your credit card number. Um, and this is a big problem. This has been the main reason why, why you can't, why these statically linked things have, haven't been used. But um, it turns out that this is a problem that you can actually solve. And more interestingly, the solution to this problem has already been shown in these slides. Did anyone spot that? No, I don't see any hands. Well, the thing is that you can't know what versions of the libraries your thing has. But your build system, it, it knows that. It's written right there. It says, this is project this, this is the version number that it's in, and then when the, the message builds it, it grabs all this information, it stores it, and it will automatically generate a manifest file that looks like this. So there's a, it's a bit of JSON, it's a dependency manifest version, and then you have the projects, uh, super app 1.0, zlib 1.28, and all that sort of stuff. And if you ship this, then you can actually do something, because you can have, like, uh, if you're a sysadmin, you can have people, like a scanner, it's like, are there any vulnerable executables in here? And then you can prevent them. Or you can change your application launcher so that it always verifies, is this still up to date? Are, are there known vulnerabilities? And if there are, you can maybe do sandboxing and all that sort of stuff. So the thing is that by giving more information, you give people the chance to do choices themselves. And this is good. And there are two different ways of getting uh, safety from, from this perspective. So this is the traditional way of doing it, which is what the distro packages does, is that the, for every library, there is one and only one version of it. It's provided by the system, everybody uses it, and if there is a problem, then you update it once, and then everything is fine. Which is cool, but what you actually want to achieve is this, is that um, you have some applications, but you want to enforce that there are no vulnerable versions of the library. So if someone wants to run GTK2, go right ahead. But that's, that's your choice. It's just that it needs to not have any known bugs. And if you have the information uh, to enforce that, then you can do that. Oh, it was a bit faster than I expected. But uh, so uh, in conclusion, so the views that we have on building and dependencies and deployment. They come from about the year 1995, and they are tailored for creating distros. And if your uh, use case is providing a distro, then using distro packages is, is the right thing to do. This, it's the best tool that has ever been designed for this particular problem. But it's a bit of a narrow view on, on this problem because there's lots of other things that you need to do. So maybe it's, it's time to, to widen the perspective on, on how the deployment and all these sorts of things should be done. So uh, that's, that concludes my presentation, and I'm ready for questions. Any questions? Um, I have a use case where distro packages don't quite work for uh, my users, um, which is where they want um, multiple versions of a particular application package available on the system at the same time and to be able to choose which version they run um, at runtime with a, you know, typing a command, we use the modules system. Um, does this package system um, make that sort of feature available? So you want to have the executable based on your build definition. So say, uh, say, okay, I want to use version X. Yeah, so say Firefox isn't the package, but say I wanted Firefox 43 and Firefox 44 and Firefox 45 all available, and the user can pick at runtime which one they want to run. So there's two parts to this. So first, first is the you compile it, and you create pa pa packages for that. So you can create a standalone package for each one of those. Which all, with all the dependencies, and then you just put them in different directories and you launch them. And, and yes, you can do that. Because the, when you have a thing that's self-contained, you can have as many as you want because they don't touch on each other because they're not installed in the system directories. And if you 
so system directories, you don't want to touch with anything except the packaging systems, because that's what they're designed for. Any other questions? How could this be integrated with an, um, uh, with a cross-compiling uh, system like Open Embedded or Yocto. Okay, so the uh, Mesen provides cross-compilation out of the box. So if you um, if you just think of it as a replacement for all the tools of CMake, then you just drop it in and it's fine. Um, but if you want to do something like you want to compile everything with that, the um, C library might be a bit tricky. You have I'd have to provide it. Otherwise, but otherwise you just have your top level thing and then you put all the dependencies you have in there and then you compile and it will use a link and, and ship it. Um, the approach you described here uh, seems similarish to the way Ruby kind of goes about it, but in a way that's compatible at a system level, which is kind of cool. But the one place I've seen that system fall down, both in Ruby and at a system level, is when you have you depend on two different libraries, which then in turn depend on an incompatible version of a of a sub library. And in current software, that's mostly not an issue because things are sort of a lot more compartmentalized now, but that really comes down to things like OpenSSL, where you have like a MySQL library which needs OpenSSL as well as you did. Um, those cases seem to become a little bit sticky. So is that something that you've thought about or seen? The only case I've seen that fixes that is where you statically link and then hide all the dependencies and then you can make it work, but that doesn't seem to be very well supported, though technically possible. Okay, so the, the way this works is that if you have, uh, oh, can, can I use the board? Are there, are there whiteboard markers in here? Um, no, anyway, but the, yeah, you can have dependencies of dependencies. So if you have two things that depend on a third thing, the way the system is set up is that you can only have one version of, the, of each dependency. So, and the system will make it so that if you use it from two different locations, they will use the same thing. So if you need a case where you would have same library two times, then you would have to give it different names and then just tell it to link with this. Um, it's possible, it's not quite nice, but if, if your, your use case is only the fact that you have one version of Zlib and you want everyone to use it, that's happened transparently. Uh, yeah, the specific case we hit was uh, NSS, which links into every program, use like OpenSSL and so if the app did it as well, you sort of got stuck. But that's just a really, that seems to be where the most common real problem I've seen in, that seems hard to solve. But it is possible to actually link in a way that the symbols no, won't clash at runtime when loaded. But that seems to be very rarely supported or used by people. Right. And that maybe could, could potentially be used. This, I haven't thought about this particular problem case, yeah. but maybe we can oh. talk about it another time. But yeah, sure, that's just the common hard problem that I really, really see. Yeah, yeah. Is it that there was, if you need to have two libraries which have the symbol with the same name and, and, and at the same time, then you're screwed either way. Thank you very much for that. I have a little gift for you for your presentation right. today. Right. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. <laughs>